it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, share with you some of um, information about the, uh, the usage and applications of EDS. I'm the uh, Managing Director of the Center for Advanced Microscopy Materials Analysis. This is very new at UConn and I'll explain a little bit about that. Uh, basically, my role there is, as manager is to ensure that the equipment is all operating at its optimum level, to uh, train and monitor the usage by the students. All um, graduate students have access to the micros full access to microscopes and are independent users. We have a user base right now, about 75 graduate students. And also, I get to operate the microscopes occasionally for our industry partners. Uh, so uh, it's a kind of a broad responsibility and um, can be a little bit overwhelming. So my outline, as required by law, I have to give you an outline, I think. <laughs> it's very brief. I'll just uh, go through that. First of all, I want to talk about CAMA. Uh, it's part of a new adventure, a new adventure, yeah. Why? It's an adventure for me. It's a new venture at the University of Connecticut involving industry partners, a mandate from the state of Connecticut to uh, begin this very ambitious partnership. It's part of this enormous $1.5 billion next gen um, program. The technology park that I'm going to be part of uh, is, is a $170 million uh, building with um, labs for several different uh, groups from UConn as well as on-site facilities for the industry partners. This is uh, what it looked like a few months ago. Um, the, um, the, uh, this up in the air section here is the office section. The, the labs will be down at uh, ground level and this latter half, the left half there is going to be where my, the microscope lab will be situated. The, the area is being designed around microscopy. The rooms will be all shielded for EMFs. The floor is stable, attached to ground, uh, bedrock. It's off at the end and surrounded by nothing but trees and deer and rabbits and things. So it'll be a very uh, quiet environment. The, the camera is um, centered around five brand new microscopes received last year from a uh, company I won't mention. And uh, in addition, we have several other uh, advanced micros microscopes of different status. Additional scopes will be arriving when we move so that in 2017 when we do move we'll have the capability of five SCM, four TM, and three FIB instruments which will give us a very fine um, facility uh, at a world-class world level. Part of the um, mandate of this technology park is the partnership with industry. And we have some major players that are giving major, uh, don uh, major commitments, including EDAX with a $12 million commitment, or two, excuse me, $2 million commitment over a number of years. So that's a huge commitment that we're grateful for. And so our partnership with EDAX is uh, very strong. And uh, we hope that it will, will grow and we'll be able to uh, assist each other in advancing the technology. So part of that is that we have on all of our instruments, we have EDS equipment. Um, the most recent equipment has the state-of-the-art EDS and EBSD systems, all of our SEM-based instruments. Uh, and those are what we see over on the wall there. We have those kinds, these, th this system and this system on uh, most of our SEM-based systems. And as well as uh, partnership with um, sponsored projects for faculty and students. So that's an important part of this whole thing. All right, so briefly I just want to talk I'm sure you all are familiar with EDS and have used it, but um, just to, reserve, to um, refresh and give me something to fill the time with, uh, the, the concept, as I want to describe it, is that we have an SEM with high resolution imaging capability together with the element identification that comes from EDS. And here's a, just a basic system with the uh, octane detector and your EBS here. I'm going to simply talk about EDS. What do I call it? This is EBSD? Sorry. Uh, so I'm just going to mention EDS in, in my speech. Um, 
And just briefly, so that we're all on the same page, the uh, interactions of the electron beam with the sample are multiple. Mainly, we are concerned about the interaction volume, that is the scattering volume of the electron beam in the sample. The resulting interactions can produce backscatters and secondaries, which we use for imaging. The x-rays we use for detecting the chemistry of the sample. So we can use those in conjunction and so image, get detailed information and very localized region. So first case study. Now part of my responsibility is operating microscope and assisting uh, industry partners. I don't have a research uh, assignments myself. I don't have research students of my own. So I'm partnering with industry and we do uh, specific work for them. And so a lot of what I do is um, proprietary. And so I'm searching for what can I present here in a public setting. I don't want people like Greg from Pratt & Whitney to become nervous that I'm gonna be giving out uh, information that's sensitive. Uh, so the first case study is uh, King George II half penny. This was uncovered in an archeological dig in Wethersfield, Connecticut, which is just south of the suburb of Hartford and a very um, old town center with some buildings still from the uh, 18th century. This coin is, uh, was minted during the period, this period in the early 18th century. And the question was, is this a real coin or is this a counterfeit, an 18th century counterfeit? And my first reaction is, why in the world would anybody counterfeit a half of a penny? Uh, but in fact, it was more common to find and receive at that time a counterfeit than a real one. It was rampant. And they had laws to the, where the punishment could be execution. And it still didn't curtail this uh, practice. So the question is, how can we determine that? So, Let's put it in the SEM. Let's obtain a uh, spectrum using EDS and then and analyze it. So here's our spectrum. Quite a lot of things going on. Obviously, copper is the main peak. Um, so how do we approach that? What do we do with all that information? So my way of thinking and the way I train students is we have to have certain key ways of looking at this data. First of all, you need to be aware of how EDS works, what its uh, strengths and limitations are. And this comes through training. I spend quite a long time uh, during training sessions when I train for uh, usually about a three hour lesson just on EDS to give people understanding of the basics, how it operates, how to use it properly, and how to interpret the data. So we need to understand our sample. That's always key. Begin with understanding as much as you can about your sample. What's the context? Are there oxides, compounds, alloys in this? Does it have contamination? And we need to have logical interpretation of the data. This is sometimes, you know, I think that uh, doesn't need to be stated outright, but sometimes people aren't using their own head. They'll just say, this is what the computer told me. That must be the gospel truth. And that's not always the case. In fact, it rarely is that simple. In fact, I, I often bring up this example. When I was a graduate student, We'd often spend our lunch time in the reading library, uh, the reading lounge at Lehigh, and there would be periodicals that the faculty would cast our way after they're done with it. And uh, we would read those and discuss some of the issues. One periodical, which was a, a free journal, so it had unjuried uh, and probably very poorly edited articles. Uh, one that we read and discussed was about this group that studied um, bullets from the American Civil War period, the 1860s. And they found, of course, lead, but they also found that there was aluminum in the spectrum from EDS. Okay, so far so good. Their interpretation of that was the people who built these or made these bullets must have had some very impelling reason to include aluminum. Aluminum as a metal had been isolated only a short time before in the mid 1800s. Uh, so they must be some sort of metallurgical geniuses, and these, this adding of aluminum gave the bullet a special properties. Um, what they were, we don't know. And uh, so, of course, we uh, found that to be fairly ridiculous. If you 
analyze the historical records about what went on in the Civil War period. The way that they fought battles was to line soldier, soldier to shoulder to shoulder. They would aim their rifles in the general direction of the bad guys and close their eyes and fire because of the smoke and flame that would come out of the back of the gun. So what's the point of putting something as valuable or more valuable than gold and rare metal of aluminum into your bullets that gets fired once and never recovered? Um, more logical? Sample holder, exactly. We use aluminum stubs in our SEM for almost every sample we put it on. Or these kind of like have a little brown tinge to them. What, what is earth made of? The most common element is alumina and silica. So if you see silicon and aluminum in a spectrum of something that came from the ground, well, that would be a more logical conclusion. Um, since then, I've decided this. people submitted this article knowing they were making a bogus claim just to see if it would get published. And they're laughing at the publishers. Not very kind. All right, let's go back to our spectrum. So here's the spectrum of our half penny. Uh, again, all sorts of elements. And in order to help us see that, I made a list like this. I'm not going to include any quantitative uh, analysis in my talks today because that's a whole other um, hour or two lecture explaining how to interpret quantitative data. We're just going to look at what it detected. All right. EDS doesn't lie. That's what it saw. How do we interpret that? Maybe our interpretation needs to be uh, thought through carefully. So first, let's think about the strength of EDS. It detects elements within a certain range, but it's a very broad range from um, atomic number four up to 92. That's a pretty broad range. And it can detect them simultaneously. But the weakness, in some ways, is it can't tell how they're combined. Are they compounds? Are they oxides? Are they alloys? that it just tells us these are the elements it saw. So we need to use our own intelligence to figure out how these might form different compounds or oxides. So in our case, what's the context? This was buried in the ground. Therefore, there might be mineral contamination, silica, aluminum, iron oxide. So those elements in the spectrum could be from uh, external source, not in our sample. Native oxides, well, is there a copper oxide? You look at this in detail. Green tinge, copper oxide, that's logical. Other contamination. Whenever I see calcium, phosphor, potassium, sodium chloride, I think of fingerprints. I don't know how this coin was handled. I know I was handling it with my fingers. Um, so perhaps those are a different form of contamination. It's not always the case, but that's logical. So if I account for everything that may be spurious. What am I left with? Copper and lead. All right, so let's consider what that might mean. The counterfeiting half pennies, as I mentioned, was rampant. The most common way that they were counterfeited was they would take a bag full of them, melt of genuine pennies, melt them, and then re-strike them underweight so that they could make more from the same number. So given a sufficient number of coins, and I don't know what the underweight value would be, but you know, the, you're know you going to make a few cents over 100 of these. Um, perhaps they tried to bring the weight up by doping it with some lead. That's a clever idea. I'm not sure the, the economics of that, but suppose you had a bunch of bullets left over from something else. <laughs> so the question is, am I right? Well. First of all, cross that off. It's not a, we're, not gonna, we're not making moral judgments here. I'm not right or wrong. And uh, as, as I'm dealing with students all the time, their first question is, what's the right answer? And my response is, the data is data. It's not right or wrong. Or your interpretation might be incorrect. So that's where we want to spend our thoughts. How confident am I in my interpretation? Generally speaking, you know, 90% confident is really high in my estimation for any kind of scientific study. So we might want to think about how can we judge our confidence level. And that can be based on your skill, experience, on background information. We have this wonderful tool today, a magical tool. It's called Google. 
And that's usually the first place I go. That's where I learned about King George II pennies, half pennies. Uh, I also learned about how do you find, where does copper come from? How is it mined? What's the ore? What's the original ore? And there are several sources. There's native copper, where it's almost pure. Uh, and that's what made it so useful many, many hundreds and thousands of years ago. You could pick up a chunk of copper and form it into some sort of tool or shape or ornament. Copper sulfides are a common source for copper. And other mixed ores, including ores that include lead. All right, so maybe the lead came from the source of the ore. Um, maybe not. I mean, it, I don't know. So what's my confidence level? Actually, it's kind of low because I'm not sure whether the only element that was in the sample is lead. There was a bunch of others that could have been part of that. Maybe lead is, um, well, so the data that I have so far examined don't lead to a definite interpretation. So what do I do? Maybe there's a better way to analyze this problem. Um, compare it to a known standard. If I had a genuine coin and did spectrum on both of those and compared them, that might give me something to go on. Maybe the genuine coin doesn't have any lead in it. Maybe if I approach it by sampling the system, the, the sam uh, preparing the sample differently, if I could cross-section it, for example, well, I don't want to cut this coin in half, it might decrease its value. Of course, if I cut it in half, maybe I have twice as much. Uh, although, with FIB, you might be able to do this in a discrete way, discrete way, and that wouldn't be visible or damage the coin in any substantial way. In fact, I have a student right now who is studying a uh, Roman coin, copper coin, trying to determine what that's actually, what its composition is, uh, and using FIB to make a cut into that, to look at it so that we're avoiding the surface oxides. Maybe there's a, another kind of analysis method that might give us additional information, not to replace EDS, but to, to help us in the interpretation. So there's several ways of going about uh, interpreting this to help boost our confidence. So again, the, the, the EDS gives us data. How well do we interpret it might be where we fall down on the job. My humble opinion is that EDS is the most abused technique that we have associated with electron microscopy. And that's no uh, critical comment against EDS. It's against us who use it improperly or against people like me who aren't training people properly in its usage. So I always find that when students come to me with problems or questions that they don't understand what's going on or how to operate, it's maybe my training wasn't sufficient rather than that their knowledge is insufficient. Okay. Let's go on to case study two where our, we'll discuss mapping. Mapping is, as you know, uh, presenting the data obtained through the spectrum, the EDS spectrum, in um, a physical image showing the distribution of each element. So the sample I'm going to use is a SOP copper silicon pattern made by lithography. And I want to know how can I map this at high spatial resolution. In order to do mapping, obviously, we have to have discrete phases. If it's uniform, the map will be uh, uniform. We have to have sharp interfaces in order to have a sharp, high-resolution map. And an important factor to consider is the acceleration voltage, which affects interaction volume. The interaction volume, as the beam enters a sample, it is scattered. And the interaction volume depends on the accelerating voltage, as you should well know. These are uh, Monte Carlo simulations of uh, an electron beam in the same material at different accelerating voltages. And you see that the interaction volume, particularly where X-ray signal can originate, is enormous at high KV. Whereas the same material is uh, lower KV, the volume is substantially smaller. So what happens if we collect the EDS map from a sample like this? at different accelerating voltages. So this is our image from the surface. Here's a cross section created by FIB showing that these features are quite small, um, half micron by quarter micron spacing. 
a little bit challenging, not impossible for EDS. Here's the spectrum. This is a spectrum correct, collected at 20 kV. We see copper, silicon, oxygen. So we have a silicon oxide. that We collect the spectrum into every pixel. Then we tell the computer, present that data so that you sh it shows each element, uh, the distribution of that element, pixel by pixel. So here's the copper map. That looks a little too good. That might be a later one. All right. No, that's actually, okay. So here's the actual uh, spectrum, and these are the maps taken at 20 kV. And uh, you can see that the, um, I'm using oxygen rather than silicon for a reason I'll explain in a minute, and copper. The maps are, this map isn't too bad, but this one's very um, fuzzy because of the high interaction volume. So here we see the oxygen map. It's um, difficult to make out. So if I operate at 5 kV, first thing we notice is, whoop, copper's gone, or the copper K peaks are gone. We still have copper L, so we can use that. So I'm going to take my map now from the oxygen K and the copper L lines, and now look at the oxygen map. A, a, a dramatic improvement. These lines, again, are two, 300 nanometer um, across and we have good spatial resolution. Notice I'm using an older system, Genesis, you know, Genesis with a, silicon, a lithium drifted silicon or silly detector, uh, and we were able to get fairly decent resolution. I would anticipate that a more uh, recent system might actually do even better. Now, I'm gonna back up here because this is significant. At the low KVs, the low accelerating voltages, we're not exciting X-rays in our spectrum. Um, at the higher end. And so this might not be applicable to every case because we don't have L's, for example, or we have a lot of L's that are overlapping, and so the maps are going to be confused. So it might not apply to every situation, but with the creative use of KV, we can uh, improve our map resolution dramatically in some cases. Moving on, I'm going to show another application, another way of, of approaching mapping. In this case, we're looking at particles uh, that are of silica alumina. And we want to characterize the absorption of carbon. These are catalyst materials. And the particles are a fairly substantial size as far as um, SEM is concerned. And uh, another approach to getting good resolution is to use focused ion beam. So I'm going to isolate, pick out an isolated particle that I can do my work uh, with the FIB and thin this section. This is a side view seeing the particle after I've done my FIB sectioning. And what I've done is created a thin slab of the sample. So instead of trying to analyze the whole sphere, which we're going to have issues with interaction volume, and the interaction volume is going to vary over the diameter of the sphere and so forth, let's just take a thin slab of that and lift it out so it's not in, anywhere in uh, other uh, particles in the vicinity mounted on the typical TEM holder. And now I have a thin slab. It doesn't have to be nanometers thin. It can be micron thick or so. And then do my EDS mapping. And here's a map, again, with the Genesis system. So it's very pixely at this size. It looked better when it was on the computer screen. Uh, and we see there's silicon, alumina, aluminum, and the red is the key, is where is the carbon? How is it distributed? Is it absorbing carbon after it's been in its um, carbonaceous environment. So different images showing the distribution of these. And then we compare that to a, a different kind of catalyst material and see so we can make side-by-side -side comparisons of how effective this is as a catalyst for absorbing the carbon. All right. Again, nothing earth-shaking there, but um, just another approach to doing this. So study the next one is uh, a dental amalgam. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with how that works. D uh, the dental fillings, where they uh, probably aren't doing that too much anymore, but I have a mouthful of these. They start with particles of uh, silver tin and silver copper, mix that with mercury. So the liquid mercury will react with the metal particles to form a stable 
new phase, which they are assuring everyone that the mercury is locked in as a solid and isn't going to hurt you. But you Google that, you're going to find all sorts of compares, conspiracy theorists and so forth. And that'll produce the silver, mercury, tin mercury, and there's going to be some leftover precursor material. So let's see what that looks like. Here's our image of uh, an amalgam material and a spectrum. And we see all the elements that mentioned, copper, mercury, silver, tin, and this map. Again, this is now uh, the um, team software on Octane SDD. You guys make, you know, make names that are so hard to remember. It's so similar. So the SDD detector. And we see this map uh, showing the distribution of the elements. And uh, we can look at them individually, copper, silver. And so we see these are copper, silver particles that didn't react. Uh, if we go back, this is also silver. And so that's the silver tin that did not react. But we have uh, a significant amount of this green material which it's not just tin, it's, uh, it's hard to see because the, the colors combine so well, uh, but there's something else going on there. So if we go back, well, yeah. So the brown is the, is the reacted phase, a uh, silver mercury, tin mercury phase, but we still we have this green material, we have to figure out what that is. So if we go back and look at this reaction, it's actually a two-stage reaction. So we have uh, remaining precursors that then react with the new product to form a new phase, a copper tin phase, and a silver mercury, another silver mercury phase. So if we go back to our map, we can now see that this is actually the copper tin. Let's go back and look at this part. So that's the green phase is the copper and tin phase. So that's a new phase that was formed from the remaining silver copper and the new phase. We can also, with these systems, you have a map, you have the data saved. We can do a line scan. We can, we can extract data from the map after we have collected it. So it's a very powerful tool. We have a spectrum at every pixel. It should, we can get a map. We can also then go back and do line scans. We can do area spectrums. We can do point spectrums. So let's do a line scan. Say, OK, show me a line scan here. And here's the profile of the line scan at that area. Here's the original particle, which was a copper-silver particle. This is the, what's remaining, the core, the unreacted core of the copper-silver. So yellow, blue, and these elements are down near zero. Here's the new phase, the tin copper phase that's around the border, and the new tin mercury phase. So you see that the mercury is infiltrating through this layer. So a lot of information can be extracted from the map post-processing. The other thing I wanted to talk about is just sit back and look at this for a minute. Sometimes we collect data that's just pretty. And this was the uh, default colors. I didn't mess with anything. That's the default colors that the team software has uh, included. And um, it's probably good sometimes to just sit back and enjoy what we get, uh, the results that we get. And I was inspired somewhat by uh, a talk I saw on the NASA channel, which often is uh, like watching paint dry. But this person was very interested in presenting a concept, which we talk a lot about STEM, especially in education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And this person said, let's think about calling it STEAM, whoop, 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 where we add an A for art. That how could we present our data without thinking about a way of communicating? And this is a great way of communicating. 
not that we have to make it look pretty, but we should be able to make it um, appealing and attractive and exciting in more than just technology terms. That as human beings, we respond to sights and sounds around us. Uh, we don't have to be machines. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out for you. you know, uh, I've stopped cutting out pictures and pasting them on my fridge, but um, in the early days, I would do that. You know, some of these pictures are really kind of, kind of beautiful to look at. Of course, people have gone um, full hog on that, and their careers are centered on using SEM and EDS to present art and colorized detector images and so forth, which is nice. Uh, I'm not that kind of an artist, but I can appreciate what they're doing and even by accident see something that's kind of interesting to look at. The last case study then, this will be real brief, um, a case where we had a defective solder joint to look at. This is the, the joint, this is the solder, this is the wire, the copper wire, this is the pad that they are soldering it to. And um, it's a lead, tin lead solder. And this is, uh, it's a classic two-phase uh, eutectic when it's, when it's uh, solidified. We can see that nicely in the backscatter uh, SEM image. So we have a two-phase lead tin solid. And the map tells the story as well. Red is lead, green is, green is tin, and there's some copper showing through that's exposed. That's not a big deal. It's no big, that's not a problem. Here's though a, a failed joint or a defective joint, and the image shows something very interesting. This is a, again a backscatter image, but we see these uh, little flower-like features that apparently were a problem. And if we do the map on that, we see that that uh, turns out to be purple, which is sulfur. Well, it's not pure sulfur, it's a sulfur copper, copper sulfide of some kind. And that's common when we have um, sulfur in the environment. Some of the fluxes they use for soldering will contain um, sulfur compounds. And you add heat to that during the melting of the solder, we can form a copper sulfide or sulfate. Or I mean, I, I put this, see, Cu2S, but there's several different forms of that compound. And summarizing to say that EDS can be very useful for a variety of applications in analyzing materials, uh, not just metals, as we discussed earlier, but um, in my work, these were examples that seem to be readily available. And I want to thank EDX for inviting me, for UConn and the Institute of Material Science for whom I work, and for the unnamed microscope company who uh, is also partnering with us.